so so now you've gotten into um, in the later issues you've you've got something you wanted to ask me about with this thing about the disclosure thing with the uh, you know what's going on now yeah because it it is pretty getting pretty heated I mean there's a lot of stuff going on well I I, I say in those early days flying saucers when I first saw psychic news flying saucers were a topic of discussion. Um, Partly because one of the assistant editor then, John Pitt, was very into that subject. Uh, but there have been whole, Maurice Barbonell wasn't at all, yeah. so uh, when he became editor, um, he, it wasn't touched on. I've only, taken, I've only come back on that scene uh, in the last three years, and been editor of Psychic News for the last three years. Um, and with the disclosure uh, program that's going on, I decided it was a good opportunity to, to come back and bring it into uh, the scope of the magazine simply from the point of view of some of the people involved. Hal Puthoff who did work with Yuri Geller and Igor Swan and remote viewing and to make readers aware that there's a lot more overlap. Um, it's not just spiritualism and life after death. Uh, we need to be uh, open to a whole range of uh, possibilities. And in the process of uh, researching what I was going to put in, in those uh, pieces, I obviously saw To the Stars and Tom DeLong's activities, and I, the last couple of issues we did a few pieces on that. We did a piece on Bob Bigelow, uh, Hal Puthoff, of course, J uh, Jim Simivan. I watched your blogs with great interest. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem I had as somebody that that has been out of the UFO area for a long time mm -hmm. and is sort of only coming back on the fringes um, was that many of the people you, you talk about are, are names that I sort of vaguely recognize but I don't know the background. Um, but I was more interested in wanting to know about your own recent personal experiences, the, the download and everything else in a, in, in a way that... Uh, yeah. Would, would sort of interrelate with what I've been experiencing. Okay, um, so I, I start with the sighting, and then I'm into the nuts and bolts. I'm into documents. I'm, I want to know which president saw something. What did the president? So I went from archives, presidential archives, to presidential yep. archives, trying to sort all this sort of stuff out. And it was sort of like your your wheels are spinning. You're stuck in mud, and you're really not getting anywhere. It's all very interesting and stuff. Mm. And then in 2012, I'm watching Colin Andrews from Great Britain. Mm -hmm. And Colin, I don't know if you've interviewed Colin, he's got some incredible stories. No, I've not met him, but I know of him and yeah. his work, yeah. It's that fascinating. So he's doing a lecture, and this is at a place called UFO Congress, which is in Phoenix. It's a big conference, one of the mm -hmm. biggest conferences in the world. It's 1,500 people register. And it goes from 8 o'clock in the morning till maybe 10 or 11 o'clock at night, and people sit in the hotel rooms until 2 o'clock in the morning, nobody sleeps. And so it's it's a one of these events, like you go to this and say, oh, I'm going to go for lunch during this one, I'm really interested. Mm -hmm. I wasn't interested in crop circles, not what, none whatsoever. Right. And I've had two experiences. I, I had that experience, and I had another one with Dr. Michael Newton, who is the guy who came up with the theory of life. I yeah. saw him lecture, and it was another lecture where I didn't intend to go in a lecture, and I just like walked out and for two days. Like, I, my head was spinning. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. All just sort of, every, all the pieces went together. So I'm with, with this lecture with Colin Andrews, and I'm saying, well, should I go? I really don't want to go. I'm not interested. And I'm thinking, well, he's a very prominent researcher. I mean, he's been his whole, de dedicated his whole life. He's very famous. I said, I'll pay him the respect. I'll go and watch his lecture. So I'm in the lecture, and I think what happened was I really wasn't paying attention. I'm sort of listening to him, and it was on consciousness and crop circles. So he, does, he has a theory, I don't know if you know, he has a theory that 20% uh, of all the crop circles are done by the entities, whatever this phenomena is. Mm -hmm. The other 80% are hoax, and he ran into a lot of trouble. He yeah. basically almost run out of the UFO community because he said 80% were hoaxed. He'd gotten some money from Lawrence Rockefeller, mm -hmm. he'd hired private investigators, and they had discovered all these people who were hoaxing these crop circles. 
but this lecture, what he said was, okay, the 80% are done by the intelligence, and the other 80% are done by hoaxers, and they're being told by the intelligence what kind of stuff to put down. Right. And he had these examples of people who would say, oh, I, this, I was sitting watching TV, and all of a sudden this idea came into my head to put this uh, thing into the crop circle, and he'd go put it in the crop circle, and in the same field, there was these women meditating on the same pattern. Mm -hmm. And it was these kind of bizarre things. So I, yeah, it was unconsciousness in crop circle. Really wasn't paying attention, and all of a sudden, it was. It came instantaneously, and when I describe to people the download experiences, the hardest part to explain when you suddenly get like inspiration or a download is that it comes with absolute certainty. There is no doubt. You don't right. have to check this. You know this is for real. So what happens is these are pieces of the puzzle that I've collected over the years. So it's not nothing new came in my head, but what it did is it took the three pieces of the puzzle and went put them together and said, "This is how it works." And suddenly it's like, "Oh, that's how it works." And what it was was. The fact that consciousness, first I thought it was consciousness, later I sort of realized that the download was actually non-local consciousness. Right. And so what it was, was there's three pieces, and the one was a, a top secret Canadian government document from 1950. So when I have my sighting, 1975, don't get anywhere, I start to investigate what the Canadian government did mm -hmm. in the early years, 1950, 1954, it was called Project Magnet. The guy who ran it was a contactee. He was in contact with an alien by the name of AFA. He had died, but I'd gone to interview his wife, and all his documents were released. They, they were hidden first for a number of years, then they were put into an archives. One of the documents is a top secret uh, UFO document. It's one of the only top secret documents in the world on UFOs. And what he had done is he was so interested in the phenomena, and he had a very high security clearance because he had basically ran the NSA, the, they were picking off Russian communications, mm -hmm. and he was in charge of this. He was in charge of what they called Radio Ottawa, that would hand out radio frequencies to different uh, radio stations and to the intelligence agencies. Mm -hmm. So he was interested, so he went down to the United States, and through classified channels, he went to the Canadian Embassy in Washington, and he asked, so what's the deal with flying saucers? This is 1950. This mm -hmm. is just as it started. This is before Damsky. This is before anybody knows yep. about telepathic aliens or anything. And it comes back, and he writes a top secret memo dated November of 1950. And in that memo, he says, We were told by American officials. I, I made discreet inquiries through the Canadian Embassy in Washington, and I was told the following Flying saucers exist. It's the most highly classified subject in the United States. A small group headed by Dr. Vander R. Bush is working on it, and it's of tremendous significance to the Americans. And what popped into my head during this Colin and Andrews lecture was the very next line of the document, which I had n never really talked about in lectures. Mm -hmm. And it said, we were also told by American officials that other things might be associated with the flying saucers, such as mental phenomena. Right. And the Americans aren't doing very well because they said if the Canadians are working on it, they're willing to exchange credentials and talk to us about it. So it was this idea of like mental phenomena, and the, the key is that nobody in 1950 was talking to aliens. Mm -hmm. The aliens would not start to appear until 1952, about seven or a week after the detonation of hydrogen bomb. That's when Adamski and Williamson came forward. Right. And so nobody was talking to aliens. There was nothing, nothing. And so how did the Americans know that mental phenomena was part of the UFO? If there was just these things flying around the sky, how would you know there's mental phenomena? Later on, I sort of assumed that maybe because they had a live alien at Roswell, New Mexico. Because the reports coming there was that the alien was talking into people's heads. And if you're an intelligence agent, you say, wow, we'd love to have this. People yep. talk to people's heads and stuff. So that was the first piece of the puzzle that came in. The second piece was we, when we went to the Canadian government, it led to, through a chain of, of people's testimony, to the former president of Penn State University mm -hmm. with 14 honorary doctorate degrees. Was chairman of the board of the Institute for Defense Analysis, the top military think tank in the United States. He had worked for Eisenhower, did engineering studies for Eisenhower. He was very good friends with Milton Eisenhower, the president's brother, uh, and just 15 years uh, president at Penn State University, the big Ivy League engineering college. And we knew that he knew something. He had confirmed that he had been at a, uh, some briefings in right. 1950. So we were trying to get him to talk, and I had uh, actually a guy from Great Britain did most of the interviews. So I sort of sit on the sidelines, and these people are all trying to get him to talk, and they're sending me what, you know, they're sending him letters and all these stuff coming back. And at one point, the guy from Great Britain asked him, he said, Dr. Walker, I want to know, is there still, there was this idea, there was this group called MJ-12, the 12 guys that controlled all the entire phenomenon. He said, is it still just 12 people? And is it all of Americans, or is this now an international group? 
And Walker said, let me ask you a question. So this pops into my head, what Walker mm -hmm. said. Walker said, let me ask you a question. What do you know about ESP? And the guy goes, uh, wow, he doesn't even really have an answer. I have no idea what he's talking about. And he said, look, unless you understand about ESP and how it works, you will not be taken in by the control group. Very few people understand how it works. Now, I had no idea about that. This was totally irrelevant. It didn't make any sense what he was saying. It wasn't until that download experience I said, oh, I know what he's talking about. He's talking about this non-local consciousness thing. Yep. This is the key to the UFO phenomenon. The third, the third thing that popped in my head was the, the Walker conversation was 1991. So 1993 was Ben Rich, the head of Lockheed Skunk Works, that's always rumored to be doing the back engineering on the flying saucers, is giving a lecture at UCLA to the engineering alumni. And at the end of the lecture, he shows a slide and he says, we now have the technology to get ET home. There's a flying saucer on the slide. And everybody laughs and people think it's a big joke, whatever. People start asking him questions after the lecture. And he said, we've discovered the mistake in the equation, and it's not going to take a lifetime to do, but it's going to take an act of God to get this thing out of Congress, because it's so deep black. It's so, so far into the, the, the classified field. Mm -hmm. So there's a guy there, and this is, comes down to this experience thing, where you have an experience, I have an experience, where you get dragged down. It's almost like it's a part of the plan that you, they drag you down the rabbit hole, and then you get interested. So there's a guy sitting in the room who now runs the MUFON International Group. His name is Jan Hartson. Mm -hmm. Jan Hartson has an experience with his brother when he's like nine years old mm -hmm. in the backyard, Saturday morning, 6.30 in the morning. His brother has something at the window and drags him out of bed and says, there's something in the backyard. And they go and there's this flying saucer in the backyard, hovering in the backyard. Mm -hmm. And he's looking at this thing. He goes running back into the house to get a, a camera. And then he gets locked. He, 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 gets, he can't get in. Or he, he's in there. And when he comes back out, this thing is gone. Right. And his brother, his whole life, he is destroyed disturbed by this thing, but Jan becomes fascinated with flying saucers. Mm -hmm. Him and his brother are trying to build a flying saucer. So his whole life he becomes an electrical engineer and he wants to know how to build a flying saucer. What's the propulsion system? So he's sitting in the audience when this happens and as Ben is heading for the door he realizes this is my one chance. I've got to ask him. So he goes running after him as he's leaving the door and he said, Ben, I need to know. How did it get here, Ben? How does it work? How does the propulsion system work? I've been fasting my whole life. I need to know. Mm -hmm. Then turns around, 1993, two years after Dr. Eric Walker, and he says, let me ask you a question. What do you know about ESP? And then Jan goes, uh, means everything in time and space is connected? He didn't, you know, he didn't know what to say. And mm -hmm. he said, that's how it works. Gets in his car and drives off. So that's where it started. And then when I did the disclosure thing, because I've been in this disclosure thing, for at least 40 years I've been yep. chasing these people because I believe they've been dropping this stuff almost from the word go, little mm -hmm. bits and pieces of the story. So when I did the disclosure thing I realized that it was the same thing, that you had these connections. For example, the guy who runs To The Stars, the director, his name is Jim Semivan, yep. he ran covert ops for the US military for uh, two years, high level CIA guy. He has an experience. Most people don't realize that a lot of these people in this thing are like you and I. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've had experience. Mm -hmm. And it's not like they're evil guys who are trying to do whatever. I mean, no. they're, they're just guys who are trying to figure it out for themselves. So Jim Semivan, in the early 1990s, had the beans in his room with his wife. And he was just absolutely traumatized. He said the next thing he knew, he was standing in the front yard in his pajamas, and this flying saucer was flying away. Mm -hmm. And he goes to the CIA, he goes to Ron Pendolfi, who's rumored to be the guy who runs the, the program. Yep. And he said to Ron, he said, I had this experience last night. I need to know what's going on. And Ron says, you don't have a need to know. He said, I don't have a need to know. This is a story I heard from a, second, a third source. Mm -hmm. I don't have a need to know. I'll tell you what, Ron. He said, you bring your boss's boss into my office. We'll see who doesn't have a need to know. And they bring George Tennant, the head of the CIA, into his office. Mm -hmm. And George says to him, leave it. Pretend it's a one-off. Pretend this is the only time it's going to happen because this will ruin your career. You do not want to touch this, this subject. So he basically goes along with it. And when he leaves the CIA in 2008, then they brief him. Then mm -hmm. they tell him what's going on, and he moves from the white world CIA UFO to the, to the black world. And now he's interacting with, with contactees. Right. And what he says, and he says this in Tom DeLong's book, he writes the foreword to his book, he actually gets into the consciousness thing. He says, the idea that you can measure this thing, the scientific method, we got to measure, touch, feel, whatever, is totally laughable. How do you define something where there does not appear to be any there, there? Mm. This has got to do with consciousness. This has got to do with multidimensionality. 
and it's beyond our present science. So you have the head guy saying consciousness. Then you have Tom DeLonge and his story. He goes to Lockheed Skunk Works. He gets invited to Area 51 when he first starts in about 2015. He's talking to the Lockheed guys, the head scientist, the director, and the, I think the assistant director, and he's talking to them and they said, when they finally get into the UFO thing, first they deny it and then they get into the UFO thing. And so this head scientist says to him, I just want to know how they work. How does it work? And he said, well, I've got some ideas. And he said, okay. And so he gives him one idea. He says, well, that might work. Anything else? And then Tom says, well, I think consciousness is involved. And then the head scientist says to him, now you're talking. And he says, at that moment, that's all the head scientists want to talk about, consciousness. That's all they want to talk about. So you have that connection. Then you have Bob Bigelow. You did a story on Bob Bigelow. Mm -hmm. Most people know that Bob Bigelow threw a lot of money into the UFO community. He bought up all the files. He's been at this for many years based upon an experience that his grandparents had yep. in the late 1940s. What a lot of people don't realize is that he put in $3.7 million to the University of Las Vegas, Nevada for a chair in consciousness studies. He knows what, what the bottom mm -hmm. line to this thing. Mm -hmm. And he actually had this famous Skinwalker Ranch. And they defined quite clearly in the Skinwalker Ranch, the, one of the reasons I was told they sold the property is because they couldn't discover anything. Not only did the phenomena know what they were doing, the phenomena knew what they were about to do, so they could not record anything on film, they could not capture anything, they could not do anything. The phenomena was always ahead of them, and so they just sort of threw up their hands and, and gave up that this phenomena had this, this consciousness aspect. And you go through all these various people, Al Putoff, I remember I, I had come to, I wrote this book called Inspired, where I had this thing where people are pulling stuff out of the, out of the, 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 ether, the Akashic field, or yep. whatever you want to call it. And so I came to this idea that the way it's done is you have a left brain and a right brain. Your left brain is your rational, analytical brain that keeps you in this world. And if you're a trans medium and you can shut that down, or if you're a meditator, you can shut it down. If you're doing psychedelics, you can shut the, the ego brain down. You can pop, or a medium, like the story I heard was a lot of mediums have childhood abuse issues. And they're able to dissociate. There's children, they, they, they have this horrible world, and suddenly, boop, they pop out and they're, they're, they're in the other world. So you, you can shut this brain down. And I remember asking Hal Putoff, so I had this idea, this is how this is being done. And I said to Hal, I said, when you did the, rem the remote viewing in SRI, did you ever uh, look at this right brain, left brain thing as to how this consciousness can work? And he just said, read chapter six. That was his answer. <laughs> <laughs> and he actually read some entire chapter. So you have this connection. And so when I saw that, when I had the download experience, everything was like, I suddenly had glasses on. I could read the street signs. It was like everything started to make sense. Everything started to fit together. Whereas before that, it was just sort of going around in circles. And that's where I say that unless you understand the consciousness aspect of the UFO thing, nobody's going to go anywhere. Because you can look at all the reports you want about theoretical space propulsion, or you can look at metal, even the, the metal stuff that is out now. Mm -hmm. If you look at the metal, there's no two pieces of metal that are the same. Jacques Vallée has 15 of these pieces that were shot out by UFOs and stuff like that over the yep. years, these kind of things. None of them are the same. And you start to wonder, I wonder if this is intentional. Maybe it's going to have to do with the flying saucer. They're just throwing this stuff out and said, let's give them one with some weird isotopes. Flip yep. this piece. And we got these pieces. And it, it shows you, again, like the UFO sighting, it shows you something's going on. We probably didn't build it, but it has, does not tell you anything about what's actually going on. And that's where I think you and I have this thing where when you start talking to people who are able to channel, to uh, inter interact, the information is all there. That was my experience from the, the download. It's all the information is there. In fact, if you've ever studied the Free Foundation, which is the foundation for research into extraterrestrial encounters, mm -hmm. what they've done is they've interviewed 4,000 people who claim that they've interacted with the phenomena, and they've given them 675 questions where they all answer. And you get these, these statistics. 40% of all people who claim to have interacted with the UFO phenomena claim at one point during their experience they knew the answer to everything in the universe. Right. And in the psychic world, you know, that's higher self, that you're talking to higher self, yep. you're into that material. 42% of all experiencers say at one point, uh, they have mathematical, scientific, or technical material in their head that they did not learn in school. And I've had, I had one woman come to me at a lecture and show me her cell phone, look at this. Shows me the cell phone, it's got this 25 page paper with mathematical formulas and stuff like that. And I'm looking at it and I said, oh, that's pretty, you write that? I said, yeah. And I said, 
that's pretty cool. She says, I'm a secretary. I've never taken science. And it was all these mathematical formulas. So you get that, then you get the thing with 50% of all people who've interacted with the phenomena say they either healed somebody or they've been healed yep. by the phenomena. So you see these crossovers, and it's the same thing. 78% say telepathy is involved. You, you start looking at the, the data from the Free Foundation and the stuff that you would get from Psychic News, and it's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing, and it's just a different form. And even the guy who ran the, the Free Foundation, when he, he had an experience, his wife was having experiences, then he decided, I'm going to go outside and I'm going to try to contact this thing. And he, the thing actually appeared, and then he went. And he was an IRS lawyer in uh -huh. the United States, and he said, there's a consciousness connection to this. I've got to figure out what's going on. So I guess he Google searched and found my name because I was one of the few people who was talking about the consciousness connection. Mm -hmm. And he said, I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you. I, I communicated with this thing. And I said, well, I'm going to be in Florida. So come, I'm going to give a lecture on consciousness and UFOs. So he came. And his wife really didn't want to talk to us. You guys talk too much. And she walked out of the hotel. She wasn't really interested because she saw it as a religious experience. Right. And um, so he sees the lecture. And then about three days later, he says he's in a traffic jam in Miami driving with his car, and all of a sudden, boop, it's like me with Colin and I, suddenly he's having this experience, and they're showing him a wheel, and the wheel is spinning, it's almost like the, the spokes of the wheel, like the, the ancient uh, 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 Eastern stuff, and one has quantum physics, one has channeling, one has psychic phenomena, one has uh, UFOs, and all these spokes, and basically it's the thing, it's all the same thing, and we parse it, we say, even in the field, I'll talk to people who are sort of experiencers who have been on board the ship and her getting mm -hmm. stuff, and then I'll be talking about channelers, and I'll go, channelers? Don't lump me in with the channelers. Mm -hmm. Ch those channelers, they're, they're just making it up. I mean, that's all garbage. And I say, no, no, it's all the same thing. I mean, some people are better at it than others. Some people are better mediums than other mm -hmm. They can get farther into the field. Yep. But it's all the basic the same thing, and that's basically the end conclusion I've got is if you want to understand it, you have to understand consciousness. Otherwise, you're going to be looking at pieces of metal. You can look at the pieces of metal for the next hundred years. You can watch all those videos that you want that they've released. It's not going to tell you what's going on. It's just going to tell you something weird is going on. But to understand it, you have to get the, the information is all out there, 40%. Yeah. The, the conflict, <coughs> excuse me, the conflict in, in what you tell me uh, and what a lot of us perceive is this uh, Accepting on the one hand consciousness is the answer, and yet there's this talk of metal, uh, the, the physicality, the skunk works, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. back engineering, which is how, why do they have a need for anything physical if it is more consciousness? There was a lecture given by um, Ingo Swan, I don't know if you ever saw it. He gave a lecture in the end of his life, he gives a lecture and he talks about. Um, why has parapsychology gotten nowhere? And he reads this thing and he says, because it's, it's, it's based on the scientific method. And he said, okay, where does this scientific method come from? And he goes back, it's Marx and Engel, 1840, this idea that there's just matter, that's all there is, and this whole idea. And that is the scientific method is based upon measuring, touching, feeling, and there's nothing beyond that. Mm -hmm. So when you get into this whole thing, that's, if you're a scientist, you're stuck in that paradigm where there's nothing beyond the physical world. Yep. And so we got to do that. And the, the skunk works on all those people, they're basically trying to back engineer it. They're trying to develop weapons and mm -hmm. they're trying to weaponize this thing. And they may have made some, some gains, uh, but I think there was one guy that Tom DeLong in one of the interviews, he said when he finally, the guy said they would talk to him. He's having this meeting in an airport or something. Mm -hmm. And then he said, um, okay, sort of like we'll go along with this but what you may find is a bunch of men standing around in a room around an elephant and you know the famous story about the elephant if you touch the trunk you're going to get one story and all they're all blind yeah. and they're just touching different aspects to indicate that they may not really know there are all these stories i sort of think of sometimes it's like the military bravado we've got this under control we've got these crafts flying around the universe and stuff like that mm -hmm. and i'm starting to think none of that is really true for example jim semivan um, there's a story told about John Alexander, who is the guy who ran all the, the weapons. And John Alexander says, when we discover this thing, it is going to be very complex, and it's going to involve consciousness. So what I was told, he had gone to Jim Semivan, and Jim Semivan said, oh, this is for real. The government is running this program. I mean, this is for real. And so John said, 
okay, so who's running? And Jim Sammy Van said, they are. And that was the whole idea. It was like, we haven't discovered anything. Right. They're basically running the show, and they're, they're basically, and there was even a story that was put out um, that I apparently came from Sembian that they'd actually abducted the President of the United States. Mm -hmm. And it happened during a news conference. So they'd shut the entire news conference down. Nobody knew what had happened except for the President. They took the President out, put the President back in, and he suddenly realized he'd been abducted. Nobody else knew. And he said, this happened. And the idea that they did that was just to show who's, who's running the show. And that's where I say the, 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 the government is covering up, they're trying to figure it out, but the aliens are covering up as well. So when you have a sighting, I say like you had the sighting of this red mm -hmm. object going across the sky, I had my thing going across, why do UFOs have lights on them? Mm -hmm. So you can see them. Mm -hmm. If they want to turn the lights off, we don't have lights on our planes, so sure. why do they have lights on their planes? They have it. It's, it's this same thing. They're, they're just slowly acclimatizing you to the fact that there's something beyond the physical world, so they'll appear. And so you have John Lennon, who mm -hmm. has his sighting in 1974, and he has the white lights around it, and he has a red light on top. And then I have one here in Manitoba, just before that, where the guy has yellow lights around the edge of the craft, and it has an antenna with, with a red light on it. So why do you need an antenna mm -hmm. on a flying saucer? Mm -hmm. It's almost like they're changing every... UFO looks different. The Adamski ones had the big balls under yep. them. Then they were the, the, the classic saucers. Now they're triangles. It's almost like they're turning the pages of a book and everything keeps changing. People mm -hmm. think that it's always been the same. And what I say is, it, it's not. I mean, if you take a look, when I started at 75, and you probably know, there was no Roswell, there was no crashed yeah. aliens, there was no crop circles, there was no cattle mutilations. It was just simple sightings. Mm -hmm. And that's all it was. And they added these new components and the stuff that happened back then, where a UFO would land, would burn the grass and leave these tripod marks, that hasn't happened for 20 years. Right. They, they stopped that. The crop circles have sort of faded away. And so you see this sort of pattern. But the whole thing about the metal stuff is, is the government trying to, uh, scientists who are in this, this uh, paradigm of, we can figure it out by measuring it, by touching it, and that sort of thing. And I don't think they've gotten as far as they, especially according to Semivan, that they haven't got as far as we think they have. And, and at the same time, when you start looking at these people and what they're saying, whether it's um, Kit Green, who's running this program that they have, where they're, they're, they, have, like, they have reports, they have medals, uh, they have the, the videos. I don't think it gets in there. The fourth one they have is they're actually working with experiencers. And I don't know yep. if you know that. They're working yes. with experiencers. And that's where they're going to get somewhere. And you've got Kit Green who's on that program and helped put us on that program, yep. and Gary Nolan, who's an experiencer. Gary Nolan is himself an experiencer. He's had download experiences and stuff like that from Stanford University. So you have these two guys that worked on the remote viewing program, and they know about this weirdness. There was one tape that had actually leaked where they're actually uh, talking in this program. Mm -hmm. And what they had was a situation where they're on the very edge that you would never do in science. You would never identify that you're doing this. But what they do is, so they have people who have had injuries from UFOs. Right. So they give them numbers, 001, 002, 003. So then Kit Green is talking to this intuitive, who he says is 95% accurate. So he's saying to her, okay, 001, describe the person. And then she goes, oh, is that, and he, she describes who this person is, whatever, and he's, okay, stop. Okay, who are they dealing with? And then she starts talking about these aliens and about this portal off the coast of California and stuff, and you're going like, wow. I mean, this is like, this is Kid Green, who is whatever you want to say. I mean, this guy has always been seen as this totally reputable guy, probably with him and Hal Putoff, and have probably the longest held top secret SCI security clearance in the United States. Right. They've had it since the late 60s, and they've never lost their security clearance. He's high, they've had all these black operation jobs, they know exactly how it works, and when you see him on this very edge of what they're doing, the other thing that I had heard that they wanted, they, they wanted to do is an experiment that they wanted to do back in 2008, and this was this thing about non-local consciousness. Mm -hmm. So Kit Green is not, it's like me, not, not really into flying saucers, not into metals, I'm, I'm into what's really going on, yep. what, what is the reality about. So Kit Green wanted to do this experiment in 2008 with a guy who was the uh, part of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to put one, uh, so a, a, a remote viewer in one MRI machine in China and one in the United States in an MRI. Then they would send the signal, a telepathic signal, a target signal, 
and they would be monitoring the brain patterns. Mm -hmm. And what they would see is, is the signal instantaneous or does it take a couple of seconds for it to go across there? Is consciousness non-local? In this tape, they actually talk about the experiment where they're going to put an experiencer in one, and they're going to put Yuri Geller in the other one in Israel. And they're going to do this experiment. They're trying to do this experiment. Right. So you can see that they're on the very leading edge of not flying saucers, but of understanding consciousness and mm -hmm. how does consciousness work. And most of this stuff with the experiencers has got to do with consciousness. Like they're talking about this brain pattern. So Nolan has confirmed that they have what's called a brain, uh, a, a brain pattern that's called the antenna. That these people, it's like a medium, it's like a psychic, they're a channeler, you know, they're, they're, mm -hmm. they're tapped in and they're able to pull stuff out of the field. And that's the term they use. And they say that all these people seem to have this sort of brain pattern. The other thing they're looking for that may not go anywhere is they're looking at for a marker. Because what they say is that when you have an experience, whether it's a cold, a flu, whatever, it leaves a marker in the DNA. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for a marker with these people to find out what is the, the sort of the, the psychic or the physiology of experiencers. So you can see they're on the very leading edge of this kind of stuff where they're, they're but most of it's not got nothing to do with metals, it's got nothing to no. do with flying stuff, it's got to do with this consciousness aspect of what these people are able to do. That there seems to be this pattern of these people. And, and that's what I think it comes down to. Is it's, it's the same thing as channelers uh, and, and mediums and stuff like that. If you start looking at them very carefully, you'll realize that they're doing something that, that is very different. And Destin and I had an experience last year that sort of tapped into that. You sort of get dragged into these things where you sort of open up and you have these synchronistic things happen. We have, we're going across to California. I had a, a, a friend of mine, she uh, a, a, comes originally from Colombia, so she's Lat Latino. Mm -hmm. And the, all the Latino people from around the world, they all go up and sit on Mount Shasta every year and sit there and meditate for world peace. She said, oh, you should come to this thing. And there's these contactees, which are, I don't know if you've ever done a story on the Mission Rama people from Peru. No. Okay, so this is one of the mission, he was trained, he's no longer with them, but he was trained by Mission Rama. Mm -hmm. And these are people who can sort of like a C5, but I say it's C5 on steroids. I mean, they can just bring these things in. So um, there was a publisher with one of my books wanted to do my book as a movie, and she wanted to do this Mission Rama thing. They couldn't finance it because it was a Peruvian story. The Canadians wouldn't finance it. So she's going to use my story to get it in, whatever. And this is a synchronistic thing. It's like, whatever. You want to do this Project Rama nonsense? I don't care what you do. We're going to California because she said, come to the mountain. And she had helped me with a lot of my books. So I said, okay, you know, she's helped me. I'll go, I'll support her. I'll go to Mount Shasta. And I have nothing against world peace. I have nothing against meditation. Didn't really want to sit on a mountain, but I go up five, 4,000 feet and we're sitting there meditating. Mm. As we're going across the desert, Destas phone rings, and there's this message from this alien, from this Mission Rama thing. And they all come from the planet Apu. This is the story there, from this planet Apu. Mm -hmm. And this alien's name is Antarel. So the message came across and said, Antarel knows that Grant's coming to the mountain and there will be a program sighting on Saturday night. And so I go, wow, it's like, you know, this is the story that they wanted to do the movie on. And I'm thinking, now I'm in the middle of this thing. And so I said to Dust, I said, get the message. What exactly is the message? Because they wanted me to put it on Facebook. And I knew that once I put it on Facebook, you know, there'd be a lots of controversy. Yeah. So I wanted to make sure the message is right. So we go there and the program sighting is, they have these, what are called antennas. The same thing as the, the same idea as this idea with the to the stars mm -hmm. running this, and it's more a secret program. It's not really to the stars. We were told that it's part of it, but it's more secret, and I think it's probably financed by Bigelow. And they're looking at this, you know, the genetics of of experiences. So they have these people called antennas, and they have these groups that have sort of broken off. It started in 1974 with two brothers. Mm -hmm. They are, they're doing automatic writing. Same thing, you get the same thing. So they're doing this automatic writing, and it's, this thing's claiming to be this alien from Apu, the planet Apu. And they say, well, how do we know we're talking to an alien? And they say, go 60 miles south of per uh, Lima, Peru, Saturday night, and we'll come. So the, these two brothers, they go, well, I think with the mother or the sister or whatever, they go, and this thing appears. Exactly, 8 o'clock. So it would be there 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock, here's this thing flies by. So then they start this thing, and they bring their friends, and they, they brought a, a reporter from, from uh, Spain, and he came, and he saw this thing, and it came exactly when they started going on the ship. Uh, just a very bizarre story. So one of the, the people is up in, in there, and this is this program saying. So uh, first I heard it was going to be between 9 and 10 o'clock at night, April, August the 19th, 2017. 
I go there and you're supposed to, they do fasting and they don't eat meat. So I said, I'll play the game. So like, hey, we're going to fast. We'll do all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. We're sitting there at 9 to 10 and we're, it's totally dark. People are meditating. They're oming and stuff. There's 150 people in this circle. pitch darkness up on the side of this mountain or whatever. And the, the guy who's the contactee, this Ricardo Gonzalez, is looking at his watch and he's walking around. And I'm going, he must be pretty nervous because if this thing doesn't show up, he's going to look like an idiot. <coughs> and he's sitting there and...